dry cleaner and he has the super detergent and uh, he doesn't reveal the secret to you because if he does you'll not be bringing those materials to him and then he uses that super detergent and he washes everything irons everything and he presents it to you you look at it from every side and from every way all the spots are gone I said all the spots are gone. You see, when you try to wash, when you start to purge by yourself, your conscience, your heart, your spirit, your soul, will be earthly detergent. You wash and wash, you pray, you fast, you cry, you shed tears, and you look at it. The earthly detergent is not able to remove every spot. And you try again and try again. You quote the promises. You lie down. You roll on the ground. You say this thing must not continue. You get up again. And then as you are praying, the old liar is still reminding you of the past life. You, he will never answer your prayer. You Don't you know who you are? If God is answering other people, look at this. Look at the spots are still there. You say, what do I do now? I'll tell you what to do. You bring uh, that material to Jesus. I said bring that material to Jesus and then he will purge, he will wash and by the time you come out the remembrance of all sport, everything is gone. The remembrance of all deficiency, incompetence in your life, all that is gone. And now you come to God and the righteousness of Christ has been given to you. No guilt, no condemnation. And now you can come in the presence of God without any sense of sin. Give me a good amen. It will do it in every life. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We're coming to number three here. Number three is our preparation for the best commendation our preparation for the best commendation you know in our lives if we're not assured that we have done something good our lives will not be happy you know you do your best and you give your best and you do everything and somebody will still find fault and say but how about this and then you'll try again and try again and you are waiting that commendation will come and once in a while they will give us commendation that's good that's all right i appreciate that i love that but then five minutes after they call us again they said uh, i told you that that was all right how about this wait when we get over there and we are completely victorious and we go through the veil on the final day and we pass through the eternal everlasting judge he will give you commendation that angels will look at you and say what is that the man is that the woman over there we're going to have the best commendation and you will have the best commendation. There will be no condemnation for you. And there will be no judgment for you because Christ has taken all your judgment. And as you rely on him, as you depend upon him, heavenly commendation. Eternal commendation. And you'll have your reward in Jesus' name. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It says, and as it is appointed unto men wants to die. Appointed unto men wants to die. Now, please understand. When it says appointed unto men wants to die, we don't all die in the same way. Moses died, and then Korah, Dathan, and Abiram died. They didn't die the same way. Joshua died, Achan died. They didn't die in the same way. David died, Absalom died. They didn't die 
in the same way. Stephen died and Anas and Sapphiras died. They didn't die the same way. And so don't, don't, don't compare yourself with, you know, the Achan and the Absalom and the Ananas and Sapphiras and say they died, they died and we're going to die. Our own dying is royal death. Yeah. Royal that the angels of God are waiting in heaven for us. And they say, he is coming, Stephen. Stephen looked up to heaven, and then he saw Jesus Christ standing on the right hand of majesty on high. And he said, I see the heavens open, and I see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of the Almighty God. And then he said, Lord Jesus, Jesus, receive my spirit. That's royal death. That's the kind of death you are going to die. You'll not die the death of a sinner. The death of a compromiser. The death of a, a sinful person. But you die. If Jesus does not come before you die, you die like a saint. I said you die like a saint. It's appointed unto men who wants to die. But after this, the judgment. Now, that word judgment is, again, you have to understand. He doesn't judge the believer as he judges the unbeliever. He doesn't judge the saint as he judges the sinner. Paul the apostle said, I have kept the faith. I have finished my work because and now a crown of righteousness is waiting for me and not for me only but for all them that love is appearing and your love is appearing so the judgment will be the evaluation of your good work the evaluation of your righteous life the evaluation of your righteous influence upon people if you're a saint of god a child of god but the other people who die the other side and they fall to the other side it will be the judgment of a sinful life and then what awaits sinners at the end of a sinful life they will get but for you believer in christ minister in Christ, child of God, and you have Christ in you, Christ in your heart, and Christ in your life, and Christ in your steps, and you are walking the way of the Lord by the grace of God. When that kind of time comes, you will have the best commendation in Jesus' name. I can just imagine as you come, you have left the world here, and the people in the world, they are crying, and then you march into the gate of heaven and the angels of God are standing up because you my sister you are coming home you my brother you are coming home and they all stand in attention and Jesus Christ who was sitting at the right hand of majesty when he went to heaven as Stephen was coming he stood up he will stand up for you and then you come in and he says welcome enter into the kingdom of god you are faithful in a few things you'll be ruler you'll be master you'll be king over many things in jesus name i'll see you there i'll meet you there by the grace of god i'll be there by the grace of god you'll be there the only thing that makes me to be there, grace. Not because of, you know, what I've done, but because of what he has done. And the same grace is available for you. Grace in me and grace in you. Grace for you and grace for me. And his grace is sufficient for you. And the best commendation is waiting for you on the final day. Don't allow the devil, he's lost everything to come to you. He's a loser and he wants to make you a loser. That will not happen to you. Look at verse 28. In verse 28 it says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin.
without the sin offering. It's done it already without the sin offering unto salvation. We're coming to point number three. Point number three here, the incontestable confidence in his surety ship. We're coming to chapter 10. Look at verse 6. Roman, um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou art had no pleasure. And then in verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is reaching of me to do thy will, O God. Christ said, I come to do thy will, O God. Now, the incontestable confidence we have in the surety ship of Christ. Three things here. Number one, his true commitment and righteousness and sacrificial resolve. Number two, truthful consecration and renewal under his supreme reign. Number three, trustful confidence and readiness for his sudden return. Look at number one. Number one is true commitment, righteousness, and sacrificial resolve. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, I to do thy will, O God. Christ said, when he came, all that he did was the will of God. The messages he preached, the will of God. The life he lived, the will of God. The sicknesses he healed, the will of God. The demons he cast out, the will of God. His prayer at Gethsemane, the will of God. is going to the cross to die for you, for me, for the rest of the world. The will of God, lo, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. I come to do thy will, O God. Look at Psalm 40. I'm reading from verse 6. In Psalm 40, we're looking at verse 6. Sacrifice and offering Thou didst not desire my ears as thou opened, bunch offering and sin offering as thou not required. Look at verse 7. Then said I, it, it will appear is David talking, but really it was Christ talking through him. It was prophecy for the Lord Jesus Christ. You will think, you will say, look at what David has said. That's the mistake we make. Sometimes when we're hearing uh, the preaching uh, of the word, we don't understand. It's not the word of the preacher. They will say, did you hear what he said? Did you hear what he declared? Did you hear what he expounded? It's not he. It's him. And here David it appeared to be talking, but it was Christ. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is reaching of me. Look at verse 8. It says in verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Christ was committed, and Christ was righteous. And Christ came to offer acceptable, perfect sacrifice unto the Heavenly Father on your behalf, on my behalf. Everything Christ did on my behalf. Everything Christ spoke on my behalf. And as he went to the Father, in the presence of the Father, and he said, I've completed the sacrifice for him, for you, for her, for you. Everything he did, he did for you. And so you cannot live from hand to mouth a poor believer. You know, somebody says, oh, poor me. Oh, wretched me. Oh, unfortunate me that I was born in a place like this. Change your language. Not too wretched do you. How can you be wretched? How can you be, you know, kind of sorrowful, unfortunate? When Christ, everything Christ did on the cross of Calvary, he did for you. Amen. 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 
Let's look at number two here. Number two here is true commitment, full, truthful consecration and renewal under his supreme reign. We come to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Having therefore boldness, we have it already. Having therefore boldness, it's like saying, having therefore salvation, having therefore a substitutionary sacrifice, have been there for its provision. Uh, there are people who are praying uh, for their lifetime. Lord, boldness. Lord, boldness. Uh, sometimes you are traveling on the way, and then you see a lorry before you. And as you look at what is written uh, at the back of that lorry, it takes take courage. Have you ever thought about that? Take courage. It's saying it's right there by your side. It's right there. And you can touch, you can reach. It says take courage. And then you close your eyes. You're praying, you're praying. Give me courage. Take courage. And you're saying, oh Lord, if I need to fast to have courage, take courage. Thank God I have courage. Thank God I have boldness. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Into the holiest, the tabernacle of the children of Israel, at an outer court, one, and the holy place, two, then at the inner sanctuary, the holiest of all. And it says, don't stay at the outer court. That's where we arch the conviction of our sin. And then the labor of water washes us from all unrighteousness. And then we come to the holy place. And there we have uh, the showbread. And then we have the manner of life. And we have the labor. We have everything. Uh, and then it says, don't stop there. That's why the average Israelites taught in the old covenant. And only the high priest could enter into the holy earth once a year. But now it says, brethren, everyone, we have the boldness to enter into the holy earth. But the blood of Jesus, you will enter. To the highest, you will enter. To the holiest, you will enter. And to the best provision of Calvary, you will enter in Jesus' name. If you find anyone complaining, anyone saying, anyone bemoaning himself, I am still like this. And this is the way I've been for the past 10 years. My situation has not changed. It's in the outer court. Now pick up courage, take courage, and take boldness, and come and enter. And this morning, you enter. I see you coming. You enter. I said, I see you coming. You enter in Jesus' name. And as you enter, you enter by faith. Look at verse 23 there. In verse 23, it tells us, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering as we are come. Don't wobble. Don't waver. Come confidently because now you are coming into the holiest of all. You of all people, you are entering into the holiest of all. Amen. And anywhere you go, you carry that with you. You become special in the sight of God, in the sight of Christ, in the sight of angels, in the sight of your neighbors. You're no more like you used to be because now you enter faithfully. Let us hold fast the profession, confession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. He is faithful that promised. I will enter in. I will enter in. A new experience. Renewal in your life. Righteousness in your life. Power in your life. In Jesus' name. Number three here. We're looking at number three. Trustful confidence and readiness for a sudden 
return. Uh, we're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 10. We're reading from verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Cast not away your confidence. That means to start with, you have the confidence. And it says, you have that confidence in Christ. You have the confidence in Calvary. You have the confidence in everything he has provided. It says, you have it, don't cast it away. You cannot cast it away if you don't have it. You have confidence in Christ. You have confidence in God. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. Great recompense of reward. You will have reward. Your life will be profitable. Your life will be rewardable. Look at verse 36. It says in verse 36, For ye have need of patience, of perseverance, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. I will receive the promise. I will receive the promise. You find somebody has prayed. After praying, he comes out of the place of prayer. And then you find him still as sad as he ever was. As sorrowful as he ever was. You say, my brother or my sister, what's the matter? It's because I prayed and I've been praying. Don't you have the confidence that he has answered? Yes, I do. If you have the confidence and you have, and you are holding fast to the profession of your faith, because he is faithful, who had promised, why are you so sad? I don't know, I'm just sad. No, you're not very sad. If you have confidence, Anna was praying, and Anna was crying, and praying, Quite, but quietly, but her mouth was moving. And Eli said, Take away your drunkenness, your wine. And the woman said, I'm not drunk because out of the body and the sorrow of my heart have I spoken. And then Eli said, Be it unto you as you have requested. The Lord has granted you. And then we are told, Anna's face changed. She became bright because she knew confidence in the Lord. What I have asked, he has given. What you have asked, he has given. Yeah. That your concern over your wife, God has answered. Yeah. Your concern over your husband, God has answered. Your concern over your children, God has answered. Your concern over your future. Will I continue like this? I want a higher future, stronger, greater future. The Lord has answered. Then you can cheer up because you know it is done. For you. For you. For we have need of patience that after we have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Verse 37. Verse 37 says, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. He will come. To bless you, he will come. To take you out of this dusty world, it will come. To take you to the place that's prepared for you, it will come. He that shall come, will come. I will not tarry. The Lord is coming for me. The Lord is coming for me. The Lord is coming for me. That place is going to prepare. I will be there. I will be there. When the saints go marching in, there is no iota of doubt in your heart. You will march in with them in Jesus' name. Verse 38, in verse 38 now, the just shall live by faith. Every day of your life, the just shall live by faith. By faith, any challenge you face, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now, it's not saying you'll draw back. I will not draw back. I will not draw back. 
is just telling you that remember there was a Judas Iscariot among the twelve but thank God what happened to Judas Iscariot did not happen to every disciple and what happened to him will not happen to me say it for yourself there was a Demas among the fellow workers, fellow laborers of Paul the Apostle, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present work. But Timothy was still there, Titus was still there, Tychicus was still there, and uh, you know, all those uh, people, they were still there. They were just one, just one, Demas, and thank God my name is not Demas. Thank God my name is not Judas. They went back, I will not go back. You will not go back. Because if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Look at verse 39. It says in verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. I am not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe and believe and believe to the saving of the soul. I believe. I keep on believing. I will always believe. The faith I have in Christ, say the faith I have in Christ, I will not let it go. It will hold your hand. It will keep you steady. And when that final day will come, I see you. Victorious, Amen. conquering, Amen. going on, Amen. he will receive you to glory. Amen. Where are you? Stand up on your feet and tell the Lord, Lord, I know you are going to hold me to the very end. It will hold you. It will hold you. It's Jesus, and we have the more excellent ministry. Think about your privilege. Hold on to that privilege. He will never forsake you.